We are privileged to have uh, this afternoon, Professor Peterson, addressing uh, our uh, departmental uh, seminars, which are now one year old since they were revived. And uh, uh, this afternoon, he's not uh, giving a seminar, he's giving a uh, um, public lecture. So, Professor Peterson, you are welcome. Thank you. I'll not take so much time because uh, uh, we, we, we are really eager to, to, to get started. I only want to thank immensely our um, principal and the dean for their presence, but much more seriously, uh, the principal's office for the support, uh, always, but uh, specifically again, uh, for uh, assisting with the resources that uh, we have uh, used to organize uh, this uh, public, uh, public lecture, uh, Madam Principal. Uh, thanks, thanks so, so much. Related, uh, we are welcoming in our midst uh, the Dean, uh, School of Languages and Communication, uh, Professor Mshian Jesse, you are welcome. So with those few remarks, um, let me take the opportunity to ask the Dean of liberal and performing arts to uh, kindly give us a few words. We will come to the subject of uh, Idi Amin. Some of you were born uh, more recently than us. But the narrative that we have of Idi Amin as an economic uh, was mainly other negative. Um, I recall as a child, uh, shortly before the firing squads of 19, uh, this when I've been put on a public uh, performance of, uh, of disciplining people. And I think uh, after the 70 years, um, and so I was then a child in uh, Ulu at that time. My father was one of the prisoners, and he was the officer in charge of receiving uh, the three people who were shot in the uh, uh, The three people who were shot. I think, no, one was drowned. He told me one was drowned uh, in uh, Karuma because the soldier said, you try to shoot that or not die. So he gave me the name Onono, but when I read through history, I guess there were two Ononos. But the other two who were shot at Peche, you know, uh, were still young people. And they would recruit, I mean, the, the families had to be there, people had to go and see, you know, uh, that uh, the state was working and uh, really trying to guarantee us uh, uh, security. But for us as small children, they didn't allow us to move, so we just had the bits of the bullets. But what I remember most, uh, uh, vividly also was that during, uh, I mean, during the economic war, um, sugar was, it was in scarcity. So one time when sugar came, uh, we had to go to the shops, and everybody has to get a kilo, you know, every family a kilo, a kilo. But the shopkeepers also got an opportunity to sell other things. So you had also to buy other things. I remember that day, they gave us a kilo of sugar, they also gave us matchboxes, they gave us nails, and then also the rat poison, <laughs> and quite a number of things. So you had to get things in a court. You know, you want sugar? I mean, the shop keep a hard process to sell, you know, all uh, the rest of the other things. But just quickly going back at the exhibition, which was at the National, uh, at the, the museum, I saw a caption, you know, that really highlighted that uh, Amin was one of those uh, leaders that worked hard in the area of sports and culture. You know, and that, that caught my attention as a person who uh, performing um, arts. So when Professor comes today to address us uh, within that particular room, it's really uh, a great uh, pleasure for us. And with those uh, remarks, I'd like to welcome uh, the principal to um, say a few words. I would like, on behalf of the college, College of Humanities and Social Sciences, to welcome uh, Professor Derek Peterson, and from now I'm going to call him Derek because that's what he likes um, to break that uh, boundary. He's not a visitor to Makere University. He's actually one of us in one way or another. 
and we would like, on behalf of the entire Makere University, to thank you for that continued um, connectedness with Uganda's history and with Makere University. Um, we'd like to thank you for that. I would like to introduce um, Derek Peterson. Uh, the official history reads as follows. That is a professor of history at the University of Michigan and of the US. He's also a research associate of the social of, in the School of Social Sciences at the University. So in that sense, he's part of choose. He's the author of Ethnic Patriotism and East African Revival, a history of dissent, which won the African Studies Association Best Book Award in 2013. And also authored creative writing, translation, bookkeeping, and the work of imagination in colonial Kenya, published in 2004. Uh, several other articles and, and book chapters uh, in living journals. He has edited seven books on history and heritage. In 2017, he won the fellowship. And uh, as of now, he's one of the curators behind the unseen archive of Idiamin, photographs from the Uganda Broadcasting Corporation, UBC, that exhibition that uh, was recently closed at the museum. As an executive member at, at uh, the ASA, African Studies Association, uh, Professor Peterson is always looking out for scholars at Makere University, both in the official capacity, in the academic capacity, as well as the uh, social aspect. We really appreciate that going out of the way to look us up uh, even when we visit uh, the University of Michigan, we actually feel uh, at home and would like to thank you for that. As an ambassador, I would like to say he has supported a number of uh, uh, staff in the history department and at Macquarie University at large. And as of now, he has been uh, discussing with uh, colleagues at Humboldt University in Germany to bring one of the um, workshops that, um, that take place across the continent for uh, graduate students. So we would like to call it a graduate uh, student symposium that we might uh, be able to host this year. Uh, but that is because um, uh, Professor Peterson is actually looking out to say some of these opportunities uh, should not pass it by pass uh, to go to Addis, then go to Pittsburgh and so on. They need also to come to Makere University. This is what will grow that discipline. This is what will encourage students to innovate in their academic journey. This is what will enable students to learn from faculty, but also to learn from each other. So as um, a person in the principal's office, I would like to uh, pledge support. It might not be in terms of resources, but in terms of the, 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 the institutional, institutionalization of this idea. And in that way, uh, trying to institutionalize uh, the, the academic culture I would like to stop here. For the past 10 years, I've been working with Uganda government institutions, with the Ministry of Public Service, and with a range of academic institutions here in Uganda, and with many of the folks who are in this audience, to organize, preserve, and in some places digitize government records across the country. The first piece of work we took on was the salvaging of the archives of Kabarole District, which were kept uh, in an attic above the district headquarters in Fort Portal. Uh, that archive was joined to an archive from the Toro Kingdom, which we brought out of the basement in Muchua, uh, in uh, the outskirts of Fort Portal, into the campus of Mountains of the Moon University, where over the course of years, the archive was cleaned up, put into order, organized, and eventually digitized. Uh, 
Uh, in the ensuing years, we've been working with MMU to add to this digital collection. Um, so uh, we uh, were able, through MMU, to acquire the archives of Hoima District and the archives of the Cabarole District Forestry Department. That scanning project has now resulted in the creation of a very large digital archive, which is housed and accessible through Mountains of the Moon University in Fort Portal. In all, the total number of scans amounts to 500,000 individual images. Believe it or not, it's the largest digitized ar archive of government documents in the whole African continent, and it's housed in Fort Portal. <laughs> Any of you who are research students are very welcome to go to Fort Portal and access it, whether digitally or on paper. This is the paper archive as it is in the campus in Kabundaere, there in Fort Portal town. Since that first piece of work, we've been sort of engaged in ongoing activity around the preservation of archives in, in, uh, in Uganda. So in 2011 and 2012, history students from Makedede worked with students from Mysore and students from Michigan to organize and catalog the national archives, which were then in Entebbe. Uh, Dr. Edgar Taylor was then a graduate student and was very much involved in that project. Uh, in 2013, we took on the archives of Kabale District. That's the uh, team undertaking that work there. Uh, those archives were likewise put into order and a catalog was created such that they could be publicly accessible for research. Uh, in 2015, we took on the archives of Jinja District, uh, which when we arrived in May 2015 were underwater. They had been kept in a basement below the district headquarters in Jinja Town, which had flooded. The archives had to be brought above ground into the district council chamber dried out and, uh, and then thereafter organized, cleaned up, and made accessible. None of these archives have been digitized, but they are available now for researchers, uh, whether in the district concerned or in the case of the Jinja records, they're kept now in the National Archives building in Wandagea. Most recently, uh, we've been working, I've been working with a number of students, some of whom are here, uh, on a project at Uganda's judiciary. That project has been led by Sauda Nabukenya, who's a master's degree holder from this institution, from the Department of History, a lecturer at Chambogo University, and a PhD student in history at Michigan. Sauda has been working with a team of students, including some folks in the back, to bring this archive, which was then in the building of the High Court, up into um, uh, the main court building to put it into order, organize it, and to create a list which will allow uh, legal clerks and judiciary officers and students and litigants, in fact, to access the legal record. That uh, archive is now accessible in the National Archives of Wande Gea as, uh, as of late last year. Uh, right at the moment, there's an ongoing project focused on the legal archive of the court at Mengo, which is a very considerable archive concerning litigation conducted at the court in the Kingdom of Uganda. Um, alongside this paperwork, I've been at work with colleagues at the Uganda Broadcasting Corporation focusing on the photographic and sound archives of UBC. Uh, that digitization work was launched in 2018 through a collaborative project joining my institution with UBC and with the University of Western Australia. Um, that project has thus far resulted in the digitization of 25,000 negatives uh, and most recently, we put on an exhibition at the Uganda Museum, which was mentioned earlier. All of this work has allowed me, as a professional historian, to find ways to compose a book about Idi Amin and the politics of Uganda in the 1970s. The argument of the book, or the purpose of the book, is to bring into view political actors who labored in the provinces of Uganda to make Amin's political vision uh, effective. The argument that underlines the project is this. There was much to inspire, motivate, and drive forward the work of local government in the 1970s. The Amin government placed Uganda, a landlocked place, uh, far away from the theater of battle, on the front lines in the global battle against racism, Zionism, as he then described it, and racial imperialism. And as we'll see shortly, Uganda's civil servants, curators, archivists, musicians and commoners made heroic and self-sacrificing efforts to pursue the campaigns that the Amin government launched. 
For many people in the provinces, the anti-racist struggle to roll back the economic and social legacies of colonialism was hugely inspiring. It imparted meaning and direction to even the most mundane aspects of bureaucratic work, transforming the field of government administration into an ongoing campaign against injustice. So in this lecture, I'm going to give you a talk based on one chapter of the book that I'm writing. I'm going to focus today on one theater of struggle that was opened up in the 1970s, and that is in the public presentation of Uganda's history. In Amin's Uganda, an extraordinarily important, uh, extraordinary importance was attached to the subject of history. There was a vast expansion almost overnight in uh, the field of conservation work as previously forgettable places were redefined almost overnight as places of vast historical importance. As the new director of the Department of Antiquities put it in 1975, here I'm quoting from his report, seldom has such a small group of people been given a broader mandate or a more exciting or challenging responsibility. New staff were brought in to uh, curate and maintain sites of heritage. The Department of Antiquities employed 16 people at the Kasubi tombs, 19 people at the tomb of King Kavalega, six people at the remote fort of Patiko, away in the north. And all the Antiquities Department hired some 70 people to curate sites of heritage in Uganda in the 1970s. One of the many people who was drawn into the work of historic preservation in this decade was a man who's not remarkable, who's forgettable, who I've never met, uh, a man named John Tumusime, who was from 1972 to 76 the culture officer in Chigezi, uh, Uganda's southernmost district. Over the course of 10 years, uh, of some years rather, Tumusime conceived, financed, organized, and built several institutions that preserved local history. For any curator, erosion of memory, of culture, of landscape, or of soil is a constant challenge. It requires unchangeable things, that is, concrete, wire fences, brass plaques, glass display cases, to transform the great events of the age into turning points in the historical record. And it always takes maintenance and repair and hard work to ensure that the objects of heritage, once they're defined, do not get lost. All of that, ladies and gentlemen, takes hard labor. Repairs are always needed. And especially in places where concrete and wire are in short supply, it takes human ingenuity, uh, self-sacrifice, and dedication to make things into museum pieces. So the question that I'm asking today is this. Where did John Tumusime and other of the people involved in Uganda's cultural economy in the 1970s, where did they get their sense of vocation from? Why, at a time when so many people were uh, dying, at a time when government was apparently so dysfunctional, uh, why is it that earnest and high-minded people sacrificed themselves for the work of cultural recovery? So, the British officials who governed colonial Uganda were confident that it was their history, their deeds, and their heroes that deserved to be remembered. In March 1935, the chief secretary of Uganda's government sent a circular around to local government authorities, directing them to, as the circular said, mark the more important historical sites in this protectorate before the passage of time has made them unidentifiable. Stone cairns labeled with memorial tablets, like the one that's in this photograph, uh, were erected at particularly important historical sites. In the years following World War II, there was a vast expansion in Uganda's memorial architecture as colonial officers rushed to capitalize on the growing global market in tourism. There was pressure to renovate, rebuild, and extend monuments to an earlier age of colonial conquest. There was a promotional pamphlet published in 1950 that encouraged tourists to, quote, follow the steps of the great explorers. This is the land of Livingston's exploration, the scene not too long ago of Stanley's dark travels in darkest Africa. There was a memorial slab installed in Namedembe Cathedral to the great conquistador Frederick Lugard in 1950. The inscription lauded Lugard for his untiring efforts, high ideals, and devotion to duty, which it introduced into Uganda British standards of administration and justice. 
Older monuments were everywhere, uh, older monuments were everywhere renovated and made more visible. So the memorial that now sits at the shore of, uh, of uh, uh, the, uh, the site of Stanley Falls was opened up in 1957 when Uganda's director of public works erected a concrete obelisk, a platform, and a shelter on the west bank of the Nile, the site of Speak's quote unquote discovery of the Nile. That place had formerly been marked with an iron peg. These and other monuments were tourist attractions. They were meant to build the memory of the romance and heroism of a British civilizing mission into the fabric of Uganda's landscape. In 1958, there was a proposal to allow African-run government councils to identify and mark sites of historical importance on their own. British officials objected strenuously to this proposal. As one of them wrote in 1958, here I'm quoting, this might very well open the door to extremist politicians agitating for the abolition of sites connected with British historical significance. Conversely, nationalist trends being what they are, they might lead to invidious arguments concerning sites of local or pretended historical importance, e.g. the birthplace of some temporarily popular local personality. That was the view of the British officials in 1958 about the prospect of allowing Africans to mark their own historical sites. Um, British officials insisted that they alone possessed the proper perspective on history to measure greatness in the past. Local government officials, even as they were increasingly uh, becoming African people, as jobs were being opened up for Africans in local government, they weren't allowed to determine what the memorial architecture ought to look like. So the concrete legacy of colonial government in Uganda was a monumental architecture that testified to the heroism and self-sacrifice of Uganda's British rulers. There was little concrete trace in the 1950s up to 1962 of African political initiative. When Milton Obote's government came to power in 1962, there was very little to work with in constructing a national personality for the country. As we saw, the colonial legacy had gifted to Uganda a concrete memorial infrastructure that said little uh, about African nationalism. Neither, as you all know, would Milton Obote allow Uganda's ancient kingdoms to act as a basis for cultural solidarity? In 1966, Obote, concerned with concentrating power in his own hands, sent in the army to destroy the palace of the king of Buganda, and thereafter he declared Uganda to be a unitary state. Some people saw it as a lost opportunity. As one student wrote to President Obote, shortly after the destruction of the Kabaka's palace in 1966. By ordering these attacks, your government has displayed a complete lack of foresightedness and a lack of appreciation of your country's culture, tradition, and history. In almost every civilized country, which was formerly ruled by kings who were later deposed by popular uprisings, royal palaces and all that goes with them are preserved even to now. They are historical monuments, relics of the past, attracting thousands of visitors every year, sources of revenue, and a lesson to generations of the future. Now, President Obote had no time for that kind of heritage business. Uh, as you know, perhaps, President Obote made a point of headquartering a whole regiment of the Uganda army at the palace of the King of Buganda. When a British diplomat visited the place in 1969, he found the palace sitting vacant and forlorn, very largely destroyed, by artillery fire and pockmarked by rifle bullets, which uh, uh, the soldiers of Milton Obote were using uh, it for target practice, basically. There was a paratroopers school established just behind the decaying bandstand that had once serenaded uh, the Kabaka in his ceremonial duties. That was how the heritage of royalty was placed out of bounds. In the wake of President Obote's thoroughgoing suppression of Uganda's kingdoms, the narrative field was cleared of orientation, and it was not clear in the late 1960s where, if anywhere, history was heading. No one knew where the ancestors of Uganda lay. In the absence of national martyrs, in the absence of a deep historical past, Uganda's economy in the late 60s up to 1971 was depoliticized. The focus was on foreign visitors. In 1963, the Obote government sent out a delegation to gin up his uh, global interest in tourism in Uganda. The delegation was led by a foreigner whose credentials 
were his avid sportsmanship and his leadership of the Uganda Cricket Association. In 1968, the Ministry of Tourism produced a series of Christmas cards and posters that advertised Uganda to foreign visitors. The posters featured scenes of cultural significance, that is, photos of dancing festivals or of circumcision ceremonies. When asked by the Ministry of Tourism to name historically important sites in Chigezi District, the local government officer responded with a list of scenic and unimportant historically unimportant places, that is, the Birunja Mountains as viewed from the Kanaba Gap or the hot springs of Karungu. There was nothing in the tourist industry of the late 60s and 70s about conflict, war, or political history. That is how, in Obote's time, the tourist industry helped make culture itself safely apolitical. Even as Obote was working militarily and politically, to deprive Uganda's ancient kingdoms of their organizational power, culture itself was being made not into a source of division, but into something like a selling point. Tourism involved the celebration of beautiful things and of safely domesticated rituals. It made culture itself into an attraction. What was needed was the right management. In 1969, Uganda celebrated international, the International Year of African Tourism. There was an invitation for officials uh, from officials for students to write essays to mark the occasion. Students had to compose essays about questions like, what can be done to camp combat poaching in my district? Or law and order in Karamoja as a prelude to developing the district as a tourist attraction. No one in the late 60s was being asked to write about political history. That's the point. As a way of capturing tourists' attention, it seems to have been effective. The number of tourists visiting Uganda rose steadily in the late 60s. 53,000 people in 1968, 74,000 in 1969. In that year, tourism was the third largest sector in Uganda's foreign exchange economy. In 1970, on the eve of the coup that brought Idi Amin to power, the number of tourists visiting Uganda rose to 78,000 people, the largest number in the country's history. In September 1971, eight months after he came to power, President Amin loaded the British High Commissioner on his personal helicopter and flew with him to Kangai in the northern part of the country to lay the foundation for two new monuments. They marked places where, in the 1890s, the anti-colonial leaders Kabalega and Mwanga had been captured. The sites were, until that date in September 1971, decidedly inconspicuous. They lay on either side of a minor road in a remote part of Uganda in a place that had never before been marked. Amin was convinced that there were lessons to be learned from these humble grounds. As he said, contrary to what one might suppose after reading foreign historians, Africans did pay an active part in their own history. If Uganda's people had joined forces then, he said, why could they not now work together? Under Amin's government, a whole bunch of previously forgettable places and unremarkable sites were made into evidence of Uganda's long struggle against British oppression. It was Amin's policy, he said, to start, quote, a thorough search and study of all meaningful sites in the hope that this will lead to a better understanding of the earlier people of Uganda. The tombs of the ancient kings were to be re rebuilt in concrete. Museums would be created at each place. All of it was, of course, propaganda, but it chimed with the wider currents in Uganda's political and cultural thought. This was the decade of authenticité, Mobutu's philosophy. This was the decade of black consciousness in South Africa. Mobutu's cultural program attracted interest and attention here in Uganda. There were calls in the Ugandan press for a revival of African names. As one editorialist put it, the Europeans came with their intention of confusing the masses they were leading. They wanted to feel great and superior by getting Africans to adopt their names. What is name wrong with calling yourself Rubanga or Minembe or other names like that? In 1972, the Amin government summarily banned the wearing of miniskirts. A year later, Amin banned the growing of bushy beards and the wearing of long hair by men. 
That would be a problem for some of us. <laughs> <laughs> Government blamed foreign hippies for all manner of criminal activity, including, according to Amin, printing counterfeit money, kidnapping, and assassination. In 1974, President Amin Barrett banned the wearing of wigs. The wigs that Uganda women wear, or he said, were, and this is a quote, made by the callous imperialists from human hair mainly collected from the unfortunate victims of the miserable Vietnam War. <laughs> In any case, regardless of where the hair came from, they were, as he said, rarely cleaned, harboring, as he said, articles injurious to life, from lice to lizards. <laughs> and they made our women look un-African and artificial. That was the theory. So here, in women's attire and hairstyle and the beards that men wore, was a further front in Uganda's long war against cultural imperialism. It was the role of government to ensure that the struggle against colonial culture was fought and won. Whole areas of life that had previously existed outside supervision, like, for instance, what you wore or how you wore your hair or what kind of beard you wore, all these things became supervisory matters. There was a wave of new departments, new ministries, and new bureaucracies, uh, which came suddenly into being to fulfill the supervisory functions that Amin imposed upon them. So the Department of Antiquities was created in 1973. The first conservator was a man named Paul Wamala, who thought his new institution's job was clear. It, it was engaged, as he said, in rediscovering our cultural heritage. In a former time, things of historical importance had been taken off to London, to the British Museum. It was his department's task to challenge the false ideas of cultural superiority which Europeans had cultivated. The Department of Antiquities sought to protect and develop sites that testified to Africans' historical attainments. There was a place in Empado, uh, in uh, Bunyoro, a small shrub ostensibly planted by King Kabalega, which in the 1970s became a site of pilgrimage for government officials and visitors who wished to dramatize their anti-colonial commitments. In 1973, in August, President Amin visited this small shrub with uh, the, uh, the Vice President of Somalia and the Foreign Minister of Tanzania, Newspapers reported that the guests were shown the spears, shields, and drums of Kabalega, which he had once used, and were conducted to, quote, a growing tree, which was planted on nine human corpses, nine sheep, and nine goats. That was the story around the shrub in Empato. Around Uganda, there was a rapid repurposing of geography. Human and natural sites were quite quickly relabeled everywhere there were reminders of the epical struggle that had to be fought. In January 1973, workers took down the statue of King George VI, which had previously stood in front of the High Court. The artist and editorialist Eli Cheyune called it, as he said, a turning point whereby colonial symbols have given way to indigenous African symbols. The statue of King George VI now sits in a back room in the Uganda Museum. That's him face down there in the transport gallery. <laughs> sure <he> is today. <laughs> um, it was a time for new statues, as uh, the um, editorialist argued. For there are ancient heroes, including the many great African heroes, who represent the dilemmas of modern Africa. Throughout Uganda, local government officials were obliged to rename streets and public buildings that had previously borne British names. It had to be done on very short notice. The Ministry of Public Service gave town clerks a mere two weeks to find names that would fit, as the ministry put it, with this country's economic, social, and political aspirations. So, over the course of two weeks, local councils across Uganda had to come up with new street names. That's how, for instance, in Kabale Town, uh, Archer Road became Makobode Road, uh, and Sharp Dormitory in Shigezi College became Lumumba Dormitory. So, too, did Queen's Road here in Kampala become Lumumba Avenue? This is the parade that celebrated the renaming of Lumumba Avenue from Queen's, Queen's Road to, uh, to Lumumba. That's a me marching there down the street with Bigwala uh, trumpeters. The effort to conserve and institutionalize cultural heritage always stood in tension 
with the human propensity to forget, to remake, to reuse, or to reframe. The things that preservationists sought to conserve, historical landmarks, shrubs, regalia, costumes, culture, all these things had formerly lived other lives. Other people were invested in them, and it wasn't easy for preservationists to wrest the substantial things of heritage out of the hands uh, of people who had other projects to pursue. So for instance, there's a place called Katasiha, one of several earthworks constructed in the 1890s during the British conquest of the kingdom of Bunyoro. In 1965, an official from Kampala visited Katasiha to establish the site as a historical monument. There was as yet no legislation to actually establish Katasiha as a historical place, um, and so the Kampala official was obliged to reason with a man named Chomya, who was cultivating the ground around the fort, urging him to make sure that the ditches and the walls were not damaged by his agricultural efforts. The matter rested there until 1974, when in 1974, the district's culture officer wrote on behalf of the Department of Antiquities to Mr. Chomya, warning him not to cultivate there at Katasiha, a historical site as it was. Chomya responded the very day he received the letter from the Department of Antiquities with a pointed response. As he said, the land I am cultivating has been legally possessed, cultivated, and recultivated by my grandfather, father, and myself since 1927. As a progressive cultivator, I am worthy to have it, and, and I'm intending to expand my farming as I've been already starting to base on the appeal of government to double production. Here's the point. At Katasiha Fort, which the Antiquities Department wanted to conserve, but which Chomio wanted to cultivate, and in all the other places that the Department of Antiquities tried to preserve in this era, there were different and contending interests in play. The preservationist impulse is always to set things aside, to separate, to conserve. All that stands in tension with human interests from other users. Preservationists always regard the kinds of things that Mr. Chomia was doing as a kind of unfaithfulness to the past, a corruption of the original purpose. But in fact, every historical site around Uganda and every place else in the world has multiple and contested uses. Every heritage site was therefore hard won then as now. So, for instance, in 1975, the conservator of antiquities put up a fence, a wire fence, around an earthwork here in Kampala, which had been erected by the king of Uganda in the late 19th century. This was a kind of forest, what you might call a fortress conservation, as people who work in this field call it. That is, the wire fence acts as a kind of demarcation between the historical site and the land that's in ordinary use. But within a month of the erection of the fence in 1975, conservators were complaining that children were playing on the fence, swinging on the fences, hanging their laundry on them, and causing the wires to bend and to break. The conservator of antiquities was quite angry about this, as you might expect. Apparently, he went to the site of this historical docu uh, landmark to complain, to say that the kids, to warn off the kids and to tell the parents to keep the children away from the wire uh, fence. Whether his admonition had any effect, I don't know. But that's the point. That's how conservation worked. Monuments are never in a solid state. We think of solid and impressive monuments as being permanent. But natural forces, the growing of trees, the erosion of soil, the drying of mortar, fire, and other such things always impinge upon the monument, making it crack, list, and eventually disappear. Maintenance is always a, a vital requirement for any monumental infrastructure. And in Idi Amin's Uganda in the 1970s, the things that it took to preserve historical sites uh, were missing, were in short supply. In the absence of necessary equipment, human labor and ingenuity in Amin's Uganda were needed to maintain uh, the complicated and politically sensitive sites of culture. In Western Uganda, for instance, there are dozens of tombs where the rulers of ancient, uh, the ancient kings of Bunyoro are buried. All of them in the 1970s as now have survived as monumental sites due to the constant labor and attention of commoners. Even the site at Empato, where the famous tree that I mentioned earlier is located, 
Even the site at Empato had to operate under austere conditions. In 1975, a visitor reported that the tomb of Cabalega's female relatives was in a state of dereliction, the regalia was being eaten by termites, and the tomb was falling down. The conservator of antiquities had the regalia removed from the tomb and stored in an office. Uh, there had been plans to build the, king of king the tomb of King Cabalega in concrete at a cost of 60,000 shillings, but in the end, government allocated a bare 1,000 shillings to meet the cost. So it fell to local people uh, to keep the site open. When the reed fence at Empato fell down in heavy wind, an official from Kampala ordered the sub-county chief to marshal a, week, a working squad within two days to clear the site and to smooth the road leading to the tomb. Another time, parish officials were given a week to collect building materials to rebuild the tomb. Each parish was supposed to deliver 300 bundles of reeds, 100, 100 poles, and 100 bundles of thatch, all to be delivered to the county uh, headquarters. None of the labor or materials were compensated. As the official noted, this is voluntary but national labor. <laughs> so this is by no means the only time that local people were called upon to contribute their labor and their resources and their expertise to the maintenance and creation of national myths. Almost all of Uganda's monuments were maintained by commoners. In 1975, a culture officer planned to erect a, a shelter at the fort at Katasiha, which I mentioned earlier, where tourists could sign a visitor's book and have a picnic while visiting the site. There were no funds to pay for the building of the shelter. It had to be constructed on what they called a self-help basis through the unacknowledged labor and sacrifice of people living in the vicinity of the fort. That's how, ladies and gentlemen, heroes were made in Amin's Uganda through routine acts and unacknowledged acts of repair and maintenance. That's also how cultures were preserved. Ordinary people, their time, their labor, and their treasure were called upon to maintain national myths. Some people acted out of sincere devotion, out of imaginations that were inspired by the opportunities of their time. Other people were compelled by force to take part. Whether out of a sense of patriotic enthusiasm or out of an intimidated resignation, it was ordinary folks who were called upon to fabricate the things on which, uh, the material things with which the Amin government could pursue its war against cultural imperialism. Finally, let me talk about John Tumusime. John Tumusime thought of himself as being on the front line of this life and death struggle over cultural imperialism. Empowered by the Amin government to preserve local traditions and manage performances, he worked hard to ensure that the fragile stuff of history would not be lost to the passage of time, that the conventions of the traditional arts would be safeguarded. Out of his own initiative, he created new institutions which could act as repositories for memory and for culture. From where did John Tumusime get his sense of purpose? To an extent that was rather greater than in any other time in Ugandan history, International affairs intruded themselves on the mundane machinery of Uganda's local governments in this decade. The great events of the age were never far away for people like Tumusime. Tumusime's files sit within the archives of Kabale District, which students from this university, from Kabale University, and from Michigan cataloged in 2013. The largest amount of paperwork in Tumusime's files came from the organizers of what was called Festac II. That is, the Black and African Festival of Arts and Culture, which was originally planned to, to take place in, in Lagos in 1975 in January, and was then postponed and actually happened in 1977. The reports, minutes, and planning documents generated by the festival's organizers in Kampala and in Lagos were copied by the Ministry of Culture and distributed even to people working out in far distant places like Chigezi. They were interleaved in the files between Tumusime's own correspondence. He plainly read them, paid attention to them, and was interested in them. There was a great amount of work required in preparing Uganda's delegation to FESTAC II. In Uganda, there were subcommittees responsible for organizing exhibitions on tattoos, cosmetics, leatherwork, woodworking, 
art, music, and a great number of other things. There was a committee to identify dances that could be performed in Lagos. There was another to select dramatic works that could be performed. Now, you won't be surprised to hear that Uganda didn't take place at the Nigerian exhibition about modern dressing. <laughs> uh, Mini skirts, of course, and wigs had been banned by presidential decree. But there was an embroidery subcommittee in Uganda, which sent out calls over Radio Uganda encouraging gifted women in embroidery to donate their work for display at the festival in, in Lagos. All of this organizational work made stern demands on the festival's organizers. These photographs are from the UBC, and they show the dancers and performers about to leave for Lagos in 1977. President Amin, as you can see in this photograph, is reviewing the dancers in costume in the company of their leader. And in the other photograph, he's addressing the Congress of Dancers as they're about to get on the airplane. It's worth saying, these are, all, these are not folks who wear this clo these clothes as a, in the ordinary course. Of, these are costumes. The costumes were collected from the provinces. There was, in Kanamoja, for instance, a campaign to collect ostrich feathers in 1976 and 77 so the dancers could wear them when they went off to Lagos. Uh, there was an official local government uh, ostrich feather storeroom in Moroto before 1977, which I think is fantastic. It's... All of this took a lot of work, as you would expect, collecting ostrich feathers, getting the costumes in order, getting the artwork together, recruiting the dancers. The Visual Arts Committee, for instance, had counted on a budget of 400,000 Uganda shillings uh, with which it planned to purchase Uganda's, as they said, best and most outstanding artistic treasures from museums in Britain and Europe. In other words, in the mid-70s, Amin was already planning to engage in the work of repatriation. He was planning, that is, at least the organizers were hoping, to collect funds such that it could be used to buy back great works of art from the museums of Europe. But at the last minute, the budget was dramatically reduced. In the end, the uh, Visual Arts Subcommittee had to make do with Uganda shillings 10,000, not with 400,000 as they had hoped. The plans had to be dramatically and quickly scaled down. There was an art show that had been planned for Lugogo Stadium. It had to be hastily overhauled. The chair of the Arts Committee was a man named Eli Cheyune, who commandeered a vehicle and uh, spent the weeks leading up to the festival driving from one end of Uganda to the other, collecting works of painting and sculpture that could be put on display there in Lagos. In all, Cheyune collected 200 objects for transmission to Lagos. For two weeks, he reports, he spent his nights in the stadium uh, laying out the exhibition. Finally, once the exhibition was laid on, a selection of those objects were sent on to Lagos where they were put on display. He wasn't the only one who had to scramble around for the materials that could be sent to Nigeria. Um, in 1973, the committee organizing Uganda's contribution to what was called Celebrity Day had to send out radio announcements asking provincial people to send in the names of locally eminent people who were suitable to be the subjects of celebrity, who were celebrities enough such that they could be documented and perhaps even brought to Lagos uh, for interviews. In faraway Chigezi, John Tumusime saw himself as an active participant in all of this activity. The chair of the pottery subcommittee visited Chigezi in 1974, collected two pots for display in Lagos. The following year, Tumusime sent four additional pots to Kampala for inclusion in the materials that were sent off to Lagos. He was careful to note down the vernacular names of each pot so that the curators could carefully label it. He was likewise very helpful to the people who were organizing the list of celebrities. In 1974, he prepared biographies of four eminent people from Chigezi and sent them onward to the committee in Kampala. Here, in a remote part of southern Uganda, John Tumusime found in the FESTAC conference a means of organizing and supporting a program of cultural recovery. Here was a funding stream that could be used uh, for uh, building and extending projects that were already underway. And here, perhaps more importantly, was a source of inspiration an impetus for a sense of vocation. Tumusime did all of this work on behalf of Festec alongside the more, more important day job which he, he had, that is, he was Chigezi District's culture officer. He took up the post in June 1972. The first report that he filed is there on the screen. The report vibrates with ideas and energy. He felt himself empowered by virtue of his position 
to speak on, as a, an authority on Chiga culture and public affairs. So in the report from 1972, he laments, for instance, the unpopularity of Chiga traditional food. As he said, educated classes tend to be interested in foreign dishes like Italian soup, hot dogs, etc., and they neglect and despise our traditional dishes like oburo, amasaza, etc. <laughs> By early July, a month after he was in his office, Tumusime was already organizing a cultural festival to celebrate the 10th anniversary of Ugandan independence. He planned to feature a talent show, a, fa a fashion show, and uh, indeed, he intended to lay on a buffet consisting of what he called the traditional foods of the Chiga people. Here there were no mini skirts, Italian shih soup, or hot dogs. The central part of that 1972 exhibition was what he called a traditional homestead built of reeds, poles, grass, and traditional furniture. So here for Tumusime is the problem. There was a tension between the idealism of culture officers like him and the fact of uh, a collapsing infrastructure. That tension can be seen in two important initiatives that he launched. In the first instance, which I'll discuss briefly, Tumusime managed to build a memorial to the end of World War I in an unlikely and unpromising and indeed inappropriate place. In a second instance, Tumusime founded a museum to local culture in what had formerly been a Hindu temple. Both of these unlikely projects were grounded, as we'll see, in fictitious or inflated accounts of the past. Both projects were driven by the political and cultural momentum of the time, and both projects relied on Tumusime himself, his energy and his ideas at the center, uh, placing him at the center of making history. In November 1972, President Amin celebrated Remembrance Day, a British holiday marking the end of the First World War in southern Uganda. Twelve cabinet ministers came to Chigezi. Most of the heads of the diplomatic missions were present. During his speech at this august occasion, President Amin told the diplomats, as he said, that the last battle of World War I had been fought at the very site where he stood. <laughs> There was a derelict stone monument there. Amin claimed it marked the place where the last shots of the war had been fired. Now, in actual fact, I know that the derelict monument that Amin was talking about was actually marking an entirely different event. It marked a place where, in 1909, a group of Indian soldiers commanded by a British major had repulsed a group of German troops marching north from Rwanda. But by 1972, the plaque that marked that monument had fallen off. And the monument was there without really any evidence to show what it commemorated. It was, it was sitting there basically awaiting an assignment. For John Tumusime, who was present at the occasion when President Amid made his speech, this offhand comment was a starting place for a whole project of historical commemoration. A few days after Remembrance Day, 1972, he wrote to the conservator of antiquities to elaborate on Amin's story. He claimed, as you can see from the letter, after World War I ended and the treaties to, sign the war were si to end the war were signed, the British Legion and the German battalions continued fighting at this place. So, the last blood to be shed in this war and the last shot to be fired was done in this place two years after the end of the war <laughs> had ended. This was due to a lack of communication for the forces here, who never knew that the war had ended, even today, one can see the big pits where soldiers used to take cover during the fighting. So, now he was right. Actually, John Tumusima was right about the offset timing of the end of the war. The German army in East Africa had, in, t in fact, continued to fight some two weeks or three weeks after the signing of the armistice that brought an end to the First World War. The problem for Tumusime was that that army, that German army, was not in southern Uganda. It was in South Rhodesia when the war ended. The last shots of the war had been fired several thousand miles to the south of the monument there in Chisoro. So in fact, John Tumusime's reconstruction of history was inaccurate. But it was good marketing. Tumusime asked the conservator of antiquities in 1972 for funding to erect a traditional house so that the site is given its full splendor, as he said. He also asked for funds to recruit a porter to stand at the place. There followed, ladies and gentlemen, a very, very long and difficult negotiation 
over the logistics by which a traditional house might be built. As it turned out, you won't be surprised about this, but traditional building routines are expensive, or were expensive, and are quite difficult to pull off. By April 1973, a porter had been hired, the site had been demarcated, and the memorial had been gazetted under Ugandan law, but the bamboo poles needed to construct a traditional house uh, uh, were hard to find. The nearest bamboo forest was some 10 miles away. They needed a lorry to get all of them moved there to Chisoro. By April 1974, four workers had been employed to build the traditional house, but they were on strike demanding payment because they hadn't been paid for their work. Uh, by October that year, the house had finally been erected. And Tumusime reported, as he said, that it was beautiful. But it was unroofed. Thatching grass was needed to cover the site. Uh, and the thatching grass was located some five miles away from the place where the monument was actually located. By May 1975, Tumusime reported that the thatching grass had actually been cut on four separate occasions, but it had never been moved to the Chisoro Memorial because there was no transportation for it. In consequence, the grass had rotted. In December 1975, Tumusime asked local government officials to impose forced labor on the residents of the place, for the bamboo frame was decaying because it was not covered up. By April 1976, the thatching was finally in place, four years after Tumusime had made his overture to the uh, conservator of antiquities in Kampala. In the end, the work was done by the residents at a place called Yakabande during a once a week communal labor that had been forced upon them by the sub-county chief. In all, it took three months to finish the job. You will be sad to hear that very, very few people ever saw the monument to the end of the First World War the one that John Stubusime had spent so much time and energy trying to build. In 1974, I know from the visitor's book that there were 60 visitors. 1975, there were six. 1978, there were 21. And I'm afraid in 1979, when the Tanzanians invaded, the thing was knocked over. The bamboo house was demolished. The caretaker of the site brought the plaque back to the district headquarters for safekeeping. By 1980, when a district official visited the place, the ground was being cultivated by farmers, and the monument sat without any marking on it at all. By 1986, there was no visible evidence that John Tumusime had ever spent his time, his energy, or his wealth in building up the monument there in Chisoro to the end of the First World War. The history of this forgotten, lost, and very difficult monument in Chisoro is instructive in a number of ways. Among other things, it tell, tells us that narrative narratives that make sites meaningful can be borrowed and plagiarized and pinned onto places that actually have nothing to do with their meaning. <laughs> but what I want to stress here, in keeping with the rest of this lecture, about John Tumusime's efforts to construct an, a monument to the end of the First World War is this. Conservation is hard work. There's always labor involved in the making of myths, and it takes concrete, wire, bamboo, thatch, and human sweat, first of all, to make history memorable. All of that takes maintenance, and that, finally, brings me on to a second project that John Tumusime pursued over the course of his career as Chigese's culture officer. That second project is the building of the Chigese District Museum. Chigese's culture committee had passed a resolution calling for the building of a museum in 1973. The aim, as Tumusime said, was to collect our traditional ornaments, the early blacksmithing, some sculptures, and other ancient and traditional skills. The Kabale Town Council agreed to allocate a plot at 14th and 15th Ruchiro Road to house the new museum. The building had formerly been Kabale Sindhu Temple. It had been seized by the Departed Asians Property Custodial Board after the expulsion of the South Asian community in 1972. Within a few months of the Indians' departure, the building had fallen into a state of disrepair. The doors, the locks, and the electricity meters had been stolen. Many of the window panes had been removed uh, or broken. In 1976, when Tubusime developed a plan for the rehabilitation of the temple, he estimated that it would take fully 60 tons of cement to rebuild the structure's floor. Uh, he hoped to put 
a craft shop on the right side of the museum, a lecture hall in the front, uh, and a showcase at the center where a diorama depicting a traditional house would be displayed. He also asked for money to employ a watchman to sit full time on the premises to guard it against intruders. But by 1977, when a new culture officer took over Tumusime's office, the museum was again in disarray. Uh, it had been looted twice in 1976. Thieves had taken away 36 window panes, two padlocks, one office desk, and all the boards that had been lining the showcases where uh, Tumusime had hoped to put the artifacts of local culture on display. The watchman who was supposed to guard the property had absconded from duty because he hadn't been paid for eight months. This museum was finally opened in July 1978, but by 1980, after the fall of Amin's government, the museum had again fallen into disrepair. A new culture officer reported that the lock to the main door was broken and out of order. The photographs lining the museum's main hall had faded with time. The paint needed renewing. He used his own money to repair the lock, and there were in fact 6,000 visitors to the museum in the first half of 1982. The conservator pointed out that the museum didn't have a toilet uh, and asked for government money to build a toilet in 1982. By 1990, the absence of toilets meant that the place, as one visitor said, smells of urine and feces is found outside the building. Uh, 30 window panes were missing in 1990. Ants had invaded the displays, consuming several of the exhibits. And children made a habit of playing on the grounds while householders grazed their cattle on the site. In 2007, that museum was permanently closed. Indians were returning to Uganda. They repossessed the building and refounded their temple. So I met John Tumusime's daughter on a Sunday morning in August 2017. <coughs> a mutual friend introduced us following an early morning service at the Anglican Cathedral in Kavale. She was the last of John Tumusime's several children. Uh, she had been born in the early 1980s, only a few years before he died. He passed away. She'd grown up knowing very little about her father. And that morning in, 19, or sorry, in 2017, there were tears in her eyes as I told her about the monument that her father had built, about the museum that he'd founded, and about the earnest work that he had done to conserve local blacksmithing, dance traditions, music, and other works of art. On that Sunday morning, I did not know, honestly, what to offer by way of an assessment. John Tumusime was in many ways a failure uh, and seen in a certain light, depending on how you look at the 1970s, his self-sacrificing work on behalf of a murderous dictator could be seen as malignant. Fest Act II took place over the space of 29 days in January, 19, uh, January and February 1977. More than 17,000 artists, dancers, and intellectuals participated. The Uganda delegation was, by almost all accounts, a great success. The Uganda stall in Lagos was said by Ugandan journalists to be a wonder, as they said. It included an impressive collection of wooden carvings, an array of articles woven from bamboo. The journalists were particularly inspired ladies and gentlemen, by the embroidery, which had been created by Ugandan women on novel and exciting patterns. They thought it was likely, as they reported, to stun visitors. When the Uganda delegation returned from Lagos in February 1977, President Amin organized a state luncheon for them. The jamboree in Lagos, he said, had set in motion a new wave of cultural awareness throughout the continent. It was for Africans to try and have greater cultural consciousness in his everyday life. I do not know what John Tumusime made of the Fest Act II conference. In April 1976, he was transferred to another district. He left many projects unfinished. I don't know for sure that any of the many articles that he had sent to Kampala were actually shipped over to Lagos for display at that Nigerian exhibition. His organizational and curatorial work was never publicly acknowledged. That is how curatorship usually works. Curatorship makes itself invisible. It makes the art and the performance appear whole before an audience without the intermediation of the people who actually get the show on the road. 
John Tumusime invested himself in two institutions, the monument and the museum, that were lost to posterity. Seen from the vantage point of preservationists, this is a story of failure, of loss of forgotten history. But the interesting questions here, as I've suggested this afternoon, are to do with impermanence itself, the transitory nature of memorial sites, and the speeding speed, the, the speeding pace of erosion in the 1970s. The infrastructure of heritage preservation in Emin's Uganda was constrained by shortage and lack, by the absence of petroleum for vehicles, by the absence of paper, by shortages of glass and concrete, by deficits in the government payroll. All these uh, deficits made the work of repair and maintenance more difficult and more vexing, more demanding of human time, ingenuity, and commitment. That is why John Tumusime's failed career as district culture officer in Chigezi is worth remembering and worth celebrating. He was not particularly successful in building permanent things, and neither did any of the institutions that he created outlast his tenure in office. But his commitment and self-sacrifice and sense of inspiration is, I think, hugely laudable. It reminds us that for some men on the front line, Idi Amin's war of culture and political liberation was worth fighting. Thank you very much. Renovating history in Idi Amin is Uganda, but I think there is some kind of subtitle, the issue of uh, this uh, otherwise obscure gentleman, from Sime. Uh, Derek here may not know that to Sime, when translated, it means we appreciate him. <laughs> It does not matter whether it is appreciating God or human beings. The issue is we appreciate him. And it seems this name, Tumsime, has something to do with appreciating people who have done a lot to preserve the history and the culture in Uganda. So as we commemorate that Tumsime, who apparently seems to have disappeared from the history of Uganda, but we are resurrecting it. Now, the presentation actually is uh, hinting around the 1970s, 1960s, but it has also gone into 1950s. And, but particularly, it concentrates on the 1970s, although it has touched on the other ones. What I see in this paper, is that Peterson was looking at Uganda or Ugandans or Africa searching for a self-identity using culture and history. Every new nation, every new nation is like a, a youth. You are always looking for identity. So you see in this research and this presentation, the search for national identity, the search for African identity. But there are contradictions. There is also the search for ethnic identity. And this causes dilemmas. There is a, a, a search for identity using history and culture. Now, uh, Peterson has been uh, raising the question as to where did this tomorrow young officer, I don't know whether he was young or old, young officer, college officer in Kigesi, where did he get the inspiration, the motivation to undertake this great work amidst the difficulties and shortages and the difficulties of the time? He has tried to answer it, but I also maybe want to add on and say that the inspiration possibly was not because of Tumusime per se, although we give him credit, but that Tumusime and his times. The times of Tumusime, the 1960s and 1970s, were times of the search for cultural identity, national identity, uh, African identity, and uh, ethnic identity in the immediate post-colonial period. And I don't think that, I wish to, uh, you could go ahead and, and, and find out some little bit of biography of this Tumusime. Where was he trained? 
if it was Makere University, in which department? Was it history? Was it literature? Was it sociology? Or any other liberal arts? And possibly he got the inspiration from there. It was a wave. It was a wave all over Africa, and it got very many people. One of the products of these times is none other than Ndevesa standing here. I wonder how many of you know my Christian name. I'm a Christian. But how many know? I deliberately disused it because of this cultural wave. The search for identity. Particularly after studying literature. These were the days of Wore Soyinka. I don't know what his name was. Arbat Chinwachebe, he dropped Arbat. He was Chinwachebe. James Nguji dropped and became Nguji wa Yongo. And uh, Okoti Bitek and many others. And in, the, in that 1960s, 70s decades, even people changed their names. The streets were changed. It was a process of decolonization. And I want to imagine that Tumusime, the other Tumusime, maybe this one, but this one, I, I, I am going to talk about his times also. <laughs> uh, was part of that wave of decolonizing the mind, of decolonizing intellectualism, of decolonizing records. So decolonization was not merely at the level of politics, but it was also in the scholarship. And this influenced also the behavior of the people. And I think that is where partly he got inspiration. But there could be others who are not inspired but the, the, that is personality. The, that is a, a personality of some people. But nevertheless, I think we have to situate Tumsime, John Tumsime, within the cultural wave, the historical wave of his times. Similarly, we have to situate Idi Amin, as you rightly pointed out, Peterson. You talked about authentic authenticity of Mobutu Sesiseko was a cook was a banga. Then you had those uh, different names of different heads of state who even tried to have certain dread, uh, dress codes. You know, Korare shirts, Kaunda suits, Yerere suits, and the likes. That was the time. And therefore, to Musime and Idi Amin fall into this one. So, Peterson, I think your paper is about also historiography. The historiography of Africa. I think students of history should be conversant with historiography. <laughs> if you are not, you better embark on that one. And the, uh, and, 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 the, and the stages through which it has passed through. And history is a dangerous subject. I think he also points it out. History is a subversive subject. Historians are an endangered species in certain respects because you will do history, you will inevitably have somewhere, somehow to be a saboteur. <laughs> he has walked us through this historiography, but there is a history, in the history which he points out in the paper, but he didn't bring out. Actually, there is a case of silencing history. It's not only preserving. I will at some point point out how I have problems with your title, Professor. Whether it was on innovation, renovation of history, but there are cases where he was actually silencing history, deliberately. So any writer, preserver, writer of history has an agenda. That's what I normally tell my students of history. He has an agenda. And this preservers of antique, antiques and these issues uh, and these uh, cultural whatever they had an agenda. Professor Peterson starts with the colonial period. The colonialist agenda was to dehumanize the African, was to show the African that he had no history so that he accepts to be colonized without, as we normally say, without bitterness. You are oppressed without bitterness. And what did you do? Instead of twisting one's hands, you twist their mind. And the one of the ways to twist the mind is to show somebody that he has no history, is nothing. You define him 
And that's what colonialism wanted to do by preserving the history monuments of colonial importance, leaving out that of the Africans, silencing the African. And I think you, you partly touch it, but I wish you could emphasize it more. So when the nationalists came into power, and after independence, particularly the reference to uh, Milton Obote and his times, I, do, I won't slightly disagree with you that he was not concerned with this one, he was a political. He was not. Milton Obote was also political. But what was his agenda? He, his agenda was to put down royal heritage and royal history. He was for the history of, according to the language of the day, and the Marxism and, the, and radicalism of the people. And he, preserved the, he tried to preserve the history of the people, whatever that stands for. But not that he was a political. He was political. If Professor Yash Standard was here, he would have told you that's not true. Because I have interacted with him several times. They were trying also to preserve what they called people's history. History from the law. History of the separatists. But deliberately silencing the history of the royal, of the royalist, royal history, monarchical history. So that is silencing. So in this historiography, now you come to Idi Amin. He also had the agendas, but one of them was to use history for legitimizing power. It was import, it was significant that you bring about this narrative of anti-imperialism. Anti-imperialism would give you legitimacy in power. Everybody would stand up for the Moise, the whatever, anti-imperialism. Then people would be excited, they would support you. Nevertheless, uh, nevertheless, don't mind whether actually they are also pro people, but you have to use the rhetoric. And this is what Amin was doing. He also was silencing history. So when you say he was uh, innovating, renovating, it is partially true. You remember he had banned the teaching of slave trade. That was silencing history, isn't it? Huh? Yeah, but also silencing the, 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 the names of other people, the statue, of, the statue of King George also being removed, the names of those other people, and renaming himself, like, like George became like what? Mobutu? Sesesebo? Then the kid what became? Idi Amin. That was silencing the history of colonialism. So he was also involved in in silencing. I can give you an example. During Idi Amin and subsequently, unfortunately, we have forgotten the history of a very famous man, uh, Field Marshal Okero. Field Marshal Okero led the Zanzibar Revolution. Unfortunately, Tanzanians have also silenced his history for nationalist reasons. They don't want to appear that a Uganda also liberated them, although we praise them that they liberated us from India. <laughs> They were actually paying us back. Okero liberated them from the control of these Arabs. But when he came, he was silenced. Idi Amin did not only silence him intellectually, but physically. He killed him. Nobody even knows where his body was buried. That is silencing history, not renovating history. One could go on and on and on and give cases where Idi Amin renovated history simultaneously silencing history. So I think you need to add on to your paper to show that Idi Amin, as he renovated, he also did silencing, including silencing slave trade for reasons best known to himself. So you see, history has got a... Uh, I, I don't want to move to the present. Is it the present history? Eh? I touch on it? Yeah, what was happening in Iba and on the sun is part of the renovating history and silencing another one. That narrative, that liberation narrative is meant to legitimize the state and to legitimize authority and the giving out of, of, of medals just looking for people. Where, where can we get somebody that we can give a medal? You know, <laughs> you know, and Uganda unfortunately is lacking on national heroes and we are trying to invade them and sometimes not succeeding. You are talking about the national myth. 
Uganda is trying to look for a national myth upon which to hang the nation. The nation is nowhere to be hanged. We are looking for, for it in the meadows, in the reparation, in the walking, in all these things. This is the search for a national myth to hang the nation. Unfortunately, it seems we are also not going very far. We are like the Tomasi, the John, not here. <laughs> so that is, uh, 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 history is either about renovation or silencing. I, I thought they need to be balanced to see through this historiography. Because this is really, I, I, I am very grateful about this survey of the historiography of Uganda. Within this chapter alone, you have already surveyed the, history, the historiography of, of, of Uganda. The question of preservation, why do we preserve culture? Why do we preserve monuments? Why do we preserve tangible culture and intangible culture? Why? There are very many reasons. And my Marxist history, if it can come in my mind, Marx used use value and there is no any other Marxist here. Use value versus what? Exchange value. Hey, I can see there are no Marxists here. <laughs> use value and exchange value. Now, exchange value is commoditizing, commoditizing everything. And use value is uh, looking at something in its own right. So there has been a tendency this time to preserve history, to have museum in for exchange value, commoditization. Kaino Tafile, when he was Minister of Tourism and blah blah, he wanted to, to, to construct a trade center at the Uganda Museum for use value. And he tried to convince us and we rejected his, his explanation. He said, no, 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 no. A museum should basically be a center for education. Not for tourism, and, uh, tourism is use value. This calls for the need to, come to, to, to have the state get interested in constructing museums, monuments, and other historical uh, artifacts and whatever for, as a public good. James Tumsime there definitely has helped us to preserve what we would not have preserved in the absence of the state. And great goes to him. But remember, he's a businessman. <laughs> Fundamentally, he is, is a use value. Primarily, secondarily, is for its own sake. Instrumentalizing history and culture. When you are instrumentalizing, you know when you are using an instrument, the way you twist it, you know? Instrumentalizing history and culture sometimes leads to silencing. You silence certain aspects of history, of culture, because you want to point out only that that promotes you. Another debate I want, uh, that this uh, presentation, I think, generates and challenges us to is to look at what kind of history are we teaching. I'm afraid for a long time the history we have been teaching has been raw history. Kabaka, Mwanga, I don't know, Omugabe, whoever that is the king of Wankore, I don't know that of Munyoro, that one of Toro. Then you go to Europe, you start talking about kings, kings, and rulers, and all those people who are in the state houses and they subsist on our labor. <laughs> it is time we, we do not silence, I don't advocate for silencing royal history like what I was trying to do. But it is also important that we bring out subaltern history. The history of the people, the history from below, the history of the marginalized, the history of the oppressed. Hitherto, we have been teaching history as if history is about kings and hunger zone, those who stay in the royal palaces and feed on the rivers of the oppressed. So, this paper provokes us in our curriculum, head of the department that the new curriculum or the revised curriculum should make sure that it does not silence some history, be it royal history or, or the history of the people. You know what I mean by the people? I'm not using it in the context of Kabajabo, Karshok, Karsoke. But we need to look at the history and, uh, and preserve it. So I think this gentleman in Kigesi 
was preserving the history of the ordinary people. And I don't know, you may have to revise it, although he was posted there in 72, but this process may have started earlier on. I repeat myself, I am not saying that we should silence any history, but nevertheless, let's note also, uh, deliberately teach only the history of the, of, of, of the political leaders. Let it not be only political history, but also economic history, social history, uh, 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 medical history, and the like, because history is not about politics only, although that is the impression we got in the past, it should now shift to other sectors, other dimensions of history. And I think this is the significance of this uh, presentation of Professor Eric. I beg to stand down and I hope I've added any value. If I'm not, blame those who appointed me to do this work. Thank you. I, uh, I want to add on what uh, uh, Mr. Mabisa was talking about. In, in terms of re, re, reinventing, when, we try, when you're trying to talk about, I mean, these are politicians, and then when you, you talk about Msime, uh, he comes across as somebody who was doing this out of uh, his personal initiative. So how, in your book, are you trying to categorize their roles or trying to separate, because, uh, Polit politicians, uh, you know very well some of these initiatives are political and uh, they might seem to the wider public as good things but they are driven uh, with politics. Uh, I also wanted to know whether you, in your book, you talked about uh, President uh, Milton Obote's uh, banning of colonial uh, scholarship in preference pre-colonial, whether this also features in the debate that you're discussing in your book. Thank you. Well, very much, including Dwanimu, uh, for your extremely helpful comments. These are interesting and important things to think with. So let me try to respond insofar as I can. First of all, it's worth saying, for those of you who are relatively new to the study of history here at Makeda Day, um, that uh, this department, the history department, was at the center of this project of cultural and historical revival in the 1970s. Not least through Danoon's book, History of Gyezi, which rested on a conference convened here in Makeda Day, in which he brought people from Gyezi, like Paulo Golobosa and Festo Karemana, and others who come to Kampala to speak in Luchiga about their historical understanding of their people before a university audience with translation, and then to publish the work at an academic press, interleaving academic scholarship with Karemana and Golobosa and others who came to the conference talking about the history of this district. It was an early uh, forerunner of a scholarship that now claims to be utterly new. In fact, it's not. Uh, Danoon and other members of this department were decolonizing the curriculum linguistically and historically in the 1970s, long before this current moment in which we sit. And there were other occasions like this. There was a book about Luo history that was published from this department in that era, too. The 1970s, the early 70s, at least, were a time of quite substantial you know, productivity in history and indeed in literature. There was this conference uh, around African literature in 1974, the Commonwealth Writers Conference, convened here in Makeda Day, in which a great number of really important people came under the chairmanship of David Cook. So I think that we should, we tend to look, when we look at the 70s, we say, oh, it's a dead zone, we have to, you know, go either before or after, let's think about Mbugi in the 1960s, blah, blah, blah. In fact, the 70s are full of creativity. In this, in this university, and history and literature are absolutely at the center of it. Um, so that's one thing. Wadimo um, uh, asks me to think about silencing history as opposed to renovating history as a kind of analytic by which to consider what was happening in the 70s. And I completely accept, in fact, that um, a means politics of racial uh, and racial, uh, what do you call it? self-definition involved, among other things, the suppression of other ways of understanding the past. So one particularly important thread of historical thought that was closed off in the latter months of 1971 was royalist political thinking. Right at the time of the coup that brought Amin to power, 
Baganda people were convinced that they were going to get their kingdom back. They organized around the funeral of Mutesa in February 1971. Amin acknowledged the urgency of their claims. He brought the body of the deceased Kabaka back to Kampala. There was a big funeral in Namirembe. Uh, the line stretched for miles and miles down the hill as people came to pay their respects. And then he was interred in Kasubi. And around that time, uh, Ganda people start mobilizing, trying to impose upon Amin the idea that a restoration of uh, a answerable African government would involve the revivification of their ancient kingdom. Uh, that opportunity is closed off by August, or perhaps by September 1971. There's a Congress of Elders uh, in which they petition Amin in August 1971. By the latter months of 71, he's uh, and his government have worked out that restoring uh, Uganda would involve uh, a whole set of complexities in his own, in the politics. But in the later months of 71, the project of defining Uganda as a unitary state was already very well underway. Um, it's worth saying that Baganda patriots were the first of many Ugandans to be, um, to be victimized, in some sense, by the Amin government. They're the first of many histories and communities that found their, their presence in Uganda, their historical vocation as a people, suppressed and pressed down as a result of the politics of racial self-definition about, about which I've talked. So I completely accept the South Asians uh, were silenced, the whole, the Kenya Luos, whole communities and categories of people were either uh, you know, expelled or actively made to um, conform themselves to a template that the Amin government imposed on them, often with considerable violence and blood. I'd say, among other things, that one machine for the suppression of alternate or silencing of other histories was, in fact, the Uganda Museum. Um, the museum, which I've worked with very closely over these past, uh, this past decade, really, and which, uh, in the 1970s, was putting on display in uh, an unproblematic way ethnographic objects that testified to the, the antiquity of African cultures, but which made no effort, in which there was no real effort to sort of situate ethnographic objects as representing ethnic traditions that could be real, meaningful, and actionable for real people. It's worth saying, in another part of the book, I, I offer a kind of history of the Uganda Museum, focused particularly on the collecting strategies of curators in the 1950s, 60s, and 70s. It's worth saying, all of the objects that are on display at the museum were made by people who were part of state institutions. Many of them were made by prisoners. Many of the ethnographic objects were at one time court exhibitions. Other things were made by school children. Almost nothing in that exhibition could be said to have been created within a notional craft economy. And yet, in the museum, all of that history of labor, of politics, of criminality, of legal action is suppressed, and everything's suppressed, presented as though it were purely ethnographic in character, as if it represented ancient African ethnicities. In that sense, the museum is a, an engine for the suppressing of alternate ways of seeing, among other things, labor and legal history. Finally, about uh, Molimo, about royal history as an enterprise, as you will have gathered, I'm deeply antagonistic as a professional scholar to the idea that history is reducible in this place or any place else to the history of kings and chiefs and such. It's complete bollocks. And it's an objectionable way of understanding Uganda's past because it makes the past seem as though it were romantic, uncomplicated, in which people lived in hierarchical, organized societies, obedient to some notional tradition. Never, that was never true. Uganda's people were always Republicans. They were always deeply invested in holding their leaders answerable to the common good. And they had institutions prior to the 20th century that they could use to exercise their will and to impose upon their leaders the obligation to conform uh, to what was understood to be the, the common interest. So today's celebration of antique monarchies in Buganda, in Toro, in Buyoro, and elsewhere is an invention of the 20th century. And to take the heritage business, I'm afraid it's actually the heritage business that's particularly to blame, as if it were the engine for the creation of a real deep Ugandan history, is to obscure the very deep history of democracy in this country. That's the important thing to say. Here, it's worth saying that the work of Historians in this department, including what I just mentioned, and the work of historians like Holly Hansen, who was here uh, last year, David Schoenbrunn, and others, to excavate the history of republicanism in Uganda is really important. So um, I'll just leave that there as a marker of alliance between myself and you.
And it's worth saying, for students of history, and for others who are co-travelers interested in the past, I don't think there's ever been a better moment, infrastructurally, to study history in this country. Uh, there's a lovely new National Archives, Amon de Gea, right next to the Ministry of Health, opened in 2016. The National Archives had formerly been in the Nauru building in Entebbe. It was inaccessible, hard to get to, and poorly cataloged. Over the course of the past 10 years, there's been this cooperative effort between this institution, my university, a lot of very enterprising students to get archives, paper archives across the country into a state of order such that they can be used by students and researchers and citizens and others who wish to make claims on the past. So it's easy to get on a boda boda and go to Wandegea and do research in the National Archives on, among other things, the district archives of Jinja, Moroto, uh, um, uh, what other district archives are there? They've got now the district archives of Soroti are there. They're bringing ministry archives in from the central government uh, that have been inaccessible since the 1960s. There's all kinds of new undergraduate and graduate projects to be pursued. I commend to you the National Archives. It's important, as you say, that we, as public intellectuals, and particularly you as public intellectuals, would organize to make sure that that building is protected against other uses to which it may well be, uh, which may be placed upon it. But the opportunity is there. There's an open door. If enough of us express, enough of you express your will as Ugandans, uh, that institution can be made into a fully operational professional outfit that can act as a repository for Uganda's art. So there's a real opportunity here, I think, to work with. Um, okay, let me go through the other questions that were raised. Thank you very much, Monique, for those really exciting questions. Uh, and I, there's more to say about all this, but um, uh, about uh, uh, Sauda Nabukenya's question. Um, for John Tumusime, as for other political actors, how does one separate out their self-interest, asks Sauda, uh, their personal interest in self-promotion from their patriotic interest in the common good? Of course, these are often, in almost all of us, overlapping impulses, um, Sauda. For Tumusime, as for anyone else that I've written about in this book, the impulse to act patriotically goes hand in hand with the interest of defining oneself as an ally of the state. So for Tumusime, as for other culture officers in the 1970s, being seen to act effectively on behalf of the Amin government was a way of protecting themselves from violence, of ensuring that the central government would look favorably upon them. It's a way of securing for themselves a life in a context in which there were a lot of dangerous things and a lot of dangerous sort of occasions around. Thus, becoming a person of prominence in local politics could be, among other things, a form of personal self-protection. It was also a way of elevating oneself within the politics of the locality. Tubusime's competing, you know, concerts and organizing plays, recruiting people. It's a, it's a way of exercising power. You're quite right about that. But I would say that the practice of patriotism is always about, to some extent, self-interest. What I would say is that Tumusime's acts of cultural recovery involve a lot of self-sacrifice, a lot of self-motivation. And that's what I think is worth studying here. Where, where does he get that sense of self-interest from? It's not only about defining himself as a person of importance. It's about entering the public sphere on behalf of uh, what he understands to be his cultural duty in his own time and place. That's the argument that I think. Uh, we started this seminar um, last year, this month, and today we made one year. We've been meeting twice, at least twice a month. <coughs> we have been meeting twice a month in the history department, sometimes outside the history department. And this is the history seminar, and it will continue. On 5th of February, 5th of February, we will have a talk by Professor Ed Steinhardt. Steinhardt is talking about Mkore. Mkore is the pre-colonial um, version of Mkore, a much smaller city. So we are inviting you again. Mkore, we, Mkore, Mkore. Yes, but he will be talking about Mkore. And so you are welcome, we invite you, and we will keep inviting all of you. But allow me to thank you, thank all of you, thank the principal, thank our dean, our head of the department, and to thank our speaker, Professor Peterson, to thank our discussant, and Pamela did a great job. So, 
We thank all of you. Please, we we'll invite you again. And the history seminar is open to other disciplines. If you are from sociology, from anthropology, from political science, you are welcome. Give us your paper, send it to me, we circulate it, we discuss it. That's what we do. So once again, thank you very much and we'll see you soon.